Hello and welcome. It's really great to be back in Perugia. Uh, this is not my first visit. Has anybody ever been to, uh, out with me at six in the morning? Thank you. Was it was it today? I recognize you. Thank you. We had some great students out today uh, as well. Um, it's only for the brave and uh, for the adventurous, uh, but it is always worthwhile. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It is an annual tradition. Uh, it started uh, when I was invited to do a mobile journalism workshop here in 2015, and I wanted to find a way to get invited back every year. That hack has been a success. Uh, these are the chapters uh, of my latest book, Mobile Journalism, which actually was rewritten um, in a second edition. The first edition was written 10 years ago in 2013 after I uh, somehow stumbled into this uh, career which transitioned from video journalism, which uh, followed a 15-year career as a news editor at some Pulitzer Prize winning newspapers. Uh, it's a complete accident, um, and we're going to talk about more than just video, okay? Because that is the most powerful reporter's notebook ever invented, and almost every reporter I've ever met does not know how to use it to its full extent. What happens when you're on holiday in Iceland? The volcano is called Fagradalsfjall. And this is our third visit to this monster. It's amazing how close we've been able to get. In fact, in previous visits, we were able to get a lot closer. In May, you could stand on this hill right across from the eruption. But that got covered over by the first lava flow. And then tourists and journalists were allowed to stand on the second hill. Well, here we are only nine days later. And that is all out of bounds because the side of the mountain has exploded out of the southeast side making new rivers of lava coming to surround this area. Over here, it has now crossed through the valley on the trail that we used to reach those previous locations. It's down in now a lower area where it's about a 10 or 12 minute walk for tourists who can come up to the edge of the glowing hot lava. So to get to the experienced viewpoint, we're following the markers indicated by the Icelandic Red Cross. They're all marked in sequence. Just follow the orange posts and you'll be at a lookout point to see the lava fields and the eruption. Okay, this is about as close as I'm gonna to get to uh, fiery rock, but I am gonna go into slow-mo mode and try for a little camera move. Fagradalfjall. I mean, Fagradalfjall. Fagradalfjall. Barbara. Barbie. Barbie Mafia. <laughs> I've all been there trying to pronounce Icelandic volcanic names. You know, walking past smoking lava fields. How, this is a lot of how my holidays go. The woman in the red coat, you'll see again, that's my wife. And she's insane. And I mean that in the kindest way. Um, she's actually crazy. And I have the pictures to prove it, about 10 years worth. Um, you'll see. Um, so to get to that story, um, 60 minutes, probably spent a quarter million dollars, hired a crew, Arctic trucks, all very fancy stuff, which you don't need. You just need a backpack and a German wife, and you can hike there. It's about two and a half hours on the day we went, the third time we went, okay? So what was in my backpack? A cinema camera, anamorphic lens, 4K, beautiful. What else was in my backpack? The other phone, her phone, and that's it. So three cameras edited on the plane ride back to Berlin on my phone. This is mobile journalism. 
Um, it's built around um, always be documenting the, uh, the ethos that there's always something interesting. At six in the morning in Perugia, that was filmed at six in the morning in Iceland, uh, the only time we could get back before we f our flight. I live in Berlin. Yes, I live in Berlin. I'm an American. I have an American passport. I'm not a German citizen. I have the full time residency um, to live there. I have to explain that to my family every time I come back to the States. Okay. Um, this is my work from home. It's the Smart Film School, uh, which was built as a result of trying to write the second uh, edition of that book that I started to write in 2013. It was going to be a trilogy. It was going to do photo, video, and audio storytelling with, with mobile devices and smartphones. And then someone from the BBC asked me, when's the video book coming out? And I was like, hold my beer. And it took me to make about 300 videos um, so that I had enough material where I could turn it into a book. But I didn't turn it into a book. I turned it into online courses. Um, and I was taping all this uh, online courses. Uh, certificate level courses, my mobile journalism course has 140 tutorials, it's 33 modules, it's 10 projects, it's used by universities. So that was the second book. Um, all I had to do in the pandemic to go live on Zoom and to have live switching in my television studio was add a little video switcher which cost 250 bucks and program some XML codes so that I could live shoot while I'm presenting and I can take you right into the overhand shot of what I'm showing you like I am right now. So that's how one thing led to another, how going on holiday leads to making um, documentaries unplanned, unscripted, and completely improvised, and how that's led to uh, a, an academy called the Smart Film School, which has 12 courses in it that are used by very large broadcasters like Middle East Broadcast Networks, um, trained 26 uh, duty stations for the United Nations communications officers. Uh, 600 journalists at Build, 600 journalists at the Hindustan Times. Uh, virtually in person, online, it's that capability is all coming out of what's possible with the phone. Um, and I have traveled to 30 countries and built up um, a lot of knowledge and how it works in different countries. You know, the, obviously the iPhone gets a lot of attention, but when my first trips to India, the only way we could do anything was with Android. When I trained 600 reporters for Radio Free Europe back in 2011, the, they insisted on Android S4 because of security concerns, though the IT department could lock it down for journalists in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and places where I was training. Um, a lot has changed. Um, this talk in 2007 was called Web Video is Not Television when I gave it in, uh, in uh, somewhere in Canada, probably in Winnipeg. Uh, because that's where you do things in Canada, right? Um, the winter peg. Um, by 2011 in Paris, it had become your smartphone is your newsroom. If you ever have met Bertrand Peccary, he's the one who wrote that headline, which was brilliant. When I gave this talk a few years ago in Cairo, uh, in front of a 90-foot LED wall, presenting from my iPad, I changed it to smartphone to silver screen, and that's really what I want to talk about. That's why I was showing something that wasn't TikTok, that wasn't a news, it was kind of, kind of a news package, but it was kind of reaching towards the higher end, you know, a little bit more art, a little bit more cinema, a little bit more gravitas with documentary than the ephemeral of social. You can do all that. You can do all types of video production with mobile. You can do all types of multimedia with mobile. It's just a tool. But the music is not in the violin. The music is in the process of how you use this reporter's notebook in your work. What I taught the journalists this morning who were brave enough to come out is that you don't have no story, no picture, no story, right? You have to report in pictures and then you have to write a story with those pictures. And then if you choose to have your voice as voiceover or piece to camera or text over video, you can write to those pictures. So mobile journalism inverts the production and documentary flow and it unlocks a different way of doing reporting for what I like to call a lot of you text-oriented journalists. I'm a text-oriented journalist. I was a newspaper editor. I've got a journalism degree, but I often find it's a lot easier to tell pictures, uh, stories with pictures first, and mobile journalism fits that sweet spot. There are a lot of people who, like Neil Augenstein of WTOP in Washington, they only use it for mobile journalism as a microphone because he's a radio reporter, and that's fine. If that's the way you want to do it, that's just fine. Um, but, okay, 
same lady, next volcano, now we're in Patagonia. Yes, it's still smoking. Um, <clears throat> so do you remember what, remember I'm looking at you, you remember when I did the walking shot sequence demonstration this morning? Okay, now imagine doing it after a three and a half hour hike up to a smoking volcano. To give a visual narrative that then you could then put the facts about that location, about what happened there and um, what's happening uh, so that you can put those two things together and create a really powerful short form video. You do not have to go to volcanoes to make interesting stories. I just, um, we'll just show you this real quick because it's, it's short form video. Um, and this is often what we're producing for social video is what we're, what are actually technically called kinograms. Does anybody remember kinograms? You probably don't remember kinograms because you weren't alive 100 years ago. But this story form was invented 100 years ago. When you went to the cinema on Saturday mornings, the music was whatever the musicians were playing down in the pit. And the newsreels were title cards and sequences. Kinograms are nothing new. You call them text over video. I don't care. That's not what it is. Um, you can take this thing, which is a 360 degree camera. I'm gonna go for this microphone, Al. Watch out, I'm on the move. I believe it's on. And um, with a clever little hack, you can attach it to your bicycle and cycle 700 kilometers to Copenhagen and take your audience with you and do daily reports. I told you my wife's crazy, right? That was her idea. This was my idea. Um, because that was a problem I was trying to solve, was how do I do, but I know it's a, not may, maybe your problem to solve, but I wanted to figure out how to solve getting good quality shots while on a bicycle, because that's one thing I can tell you. I don't own a car, but I own two brilliant German bicycles, and they are equipped with waterproof bags and all the camping gear because my wife's crazy and I have the pictures to prove it. If you want to see that, how mobile journalism is done with small cameras in waterproof bags on German bikes going 700 kilometers, there's the blog post. But that's one explanation, that's one case study where I explored different types of video storytelling, different types of visual storytelling. Sometimes I'm using the screen capture of my device to record animated graphics that I use in my sequences. I'm trying to get the full reporting power available at all times. And so I use the field, whether it's volcanoes or insane bike trips, to test what is possible, what works and what doesn't. So I can put it in my courses, books and workshops and trainings, okay? This fluency of understanding that video is much more than a news package, video is much more than a, a TikTok. Um, is a, a basically a foreign language. It's something you can learn. And maybe I built my courses because I was, had to learn German to be able to stay in Germany. It's one of the things you have to do. Yeah, Deutsch, yeah. You have to speak enough to fool them that you know German. But um, the only real, the, the real test is to marry a German because therefore you become, when your wife is German, therefore you become German because it changes all your thinking. Right, it's a, it's a whole other story. We can talk at, uh, uh, at, the, at the Restaurante del Sol about that later. Now, because she'll be there. Um, <clears throat> I was just in Washington and I just had an evening with my dear friend, Lynn Sweet, who's the Washington Bureau Chief of the Chicago Sun-Times, that newspaper I used to work at before I started this crazy adventure. Um, she <clears throat> uses her phone and always has as a reporter. She uses it like I talk about, as a great documentary gathering, evidence gathering device. Just so happened she had to document a mass shooting when she was vis uh, visiting her sister in Chicago, excuse me. Probably don't need this right now, right? So I'll go back to this microphone. Um, I asked her a couple weeks later, I got her, um, and I asked her, can I, can I just ask you about what was that like? What did you do? How did you respond when that was, all you had was your phone and you are a reporter? Without a charge phone, you got nothing. And you take pictures first and decide what you want to do with them later. And if you could stomach it, you just take a picture. You, you know, you just take pictures. And one other thing, when you asked me, did anyone stop me, is I was in the middle of a shooting scene, the last thing I did. But, but here's the thing. You don't go up and shoot a close-up. Yeah. 
Now, if I had a professional camera, I could have, with a real long lens, yeah. I could have gotten more. But I didn't because I was just there. Uh, the iPhone is where Mark has where when you could still be a distance, and as you know better than anyone, because you are like a father of iPhone recording. <laughs> when you do close up on an iPhone, you could still do a pretty good job. You can still do a pretty good job. She did an amazing job. Now, that 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 that, <clears throat> that ethos is that it's your job as a reporter to document death and destruction if that happens. Okay, whether you decide to publish it or air it, that's a separate decision and it may not be yours, okay? You may be involved in the conversation. Ultimately, what they decided to do, but, but having that evidence that you can refer to when you're writing about it is important, okay? Because you'll be able to describe the color of the clothing, the angle of the shoe, whatever it needs, right? Without having to show the photo. So there is a new superpower with, with the latest iPhones, and it's only on iPhones because it's an Apple technology. It's called ProRes that allows you, when you go into ProRes mode, to do things that I could never do before. Like when there's um, a sudden uh, police action at my favorite market, the Hackische Markt in Germany. I can take my phone out, go into ProRes, shoot clandestine night interiors, protests, without barely being noticed. <laughs> didn't even notice me. I just looked like any other tourist. That's a superpower. Okay, it gets more confusing when you start to do more complicated uh, visual storytelling. Who here can tell me what, what you're seeing? What are you looking at? Anybody? Yeah? It's what? A drone. No, this is a story. And it's a story that is reported in six discrete tracks, okay? What you're looking at in blue are three lanes of visual information. And whatever, vis whatever uh, is shown on a, on a lane above the other, that's what the viewer will see. Below, so in other words, it switches between shots. What below, the green, is audio, and that is mixed. So that all becomes simultaneous. So as a reporter, I train you to understand that when you go into a video editing app like LumaFusion on your phone or on your iPad, where your pieces of reporting need to go to make sense as a visual story. That's where you put the stuff. That's the easiest way to show you because there are so many layers of reporting that you can do with that device. Um, it can become really confusing if you start to then say, well, I've got a whole basket of clips and I have a video editing app. Guess what? There ain't no AI that's going to make a news package for you that's going to make sense. You have to go step by step and find the story with your pictures, find the words that go with those pictures, and put it together into a creative story arc. To do that, you will use a suite of apps as a mobile journalist. Yep, go ahead, take a picture of that. It may say, oh my gosh, I'm reading the QR code. Yes, that's my contact information. You can get more from me later. You can get these slides later. Just contact me. This is all I really use in the permanent tray. I want always uh, access to my camera, my best camera, my video editing app, my basket of pictures. That's it. That's all I need. And, and then the, everything else is kind of special purpose. So I make a page for mobile journalism. So when I come to a conference, when I go out in the street and I'm ready to find a new story, um, because I do not find stories sitting around conference tables or in Zoom meetings with other journalists. I find them mise-en-scene. I find them in the moment, like you saw uh, already some examples of. So I have uh, this Hi Hello app. It's a great app. It's free. You can make four different cards, which means you can have four different personas of yourself as a journalist. Um, if you tap on my hi, hello, uh, I will show you. I've got one that's for my book. I've got one for the street. 
I've got one for contacts and I've got one for book a video chat because you want some consulting or something like that. So depending on the interaction I'm having with someone, I will open a different business card and it will just give them the contact information I have. That's really a superpower. Um, I also use watch apps like drafts so that I can make audio notes and then I can instantly edit them on my phone. That's not a video, that's an, so those are two other apps that I use a lot uh, as mobile journalism. I, I'm stealing a page from my book here, um, so you can see uh, what most of the apps I look for are free because I deal a lot with uh, media development, NGOs, and students, okay, and cheap broadcasters that don't want to pay for anything. So I, I'm definitely interested uh, in free stuff or low-cost, one-time purchase stuff. I'm, my, my audience, I've trained over 30,000 people, they are almost 0% interested in that has anything that has a subscription. Yeah. So, but the Double Take app is a really cool app because you can record two of the four cameras on like a modern iPhone. And you get to decide which ones, and you get to decide at the frame rate, which is really important, um, and um, how you want it recorded as two separate files or picture in picture or split screen. And actually, the split screen is pretty fun to use because uh, if you're not a video editor, you want something that's kind of quick and dirty and you're, you want to do a quick uh, report, you might try that app um, and do maybe a report about lunch. Okay, my wife was getting her hair done. Uh, no volcanoes, just Berlin. Double take. And this place is called the Burgermeister, which means mayor <laughs> in German. And of course, this is not the mayor's office of Berlin, but we're gonna find out if they have a good cheeseburger. So while I'm waiting for my cheeseburger, let's take a look at this building, which was obviously built as a toilet. There's the women's side, there's the men's side, Mena. But the only men inside here are making burgers. That's it, there's my burger. Du bist ein Bürgermeister. Danke schön. I had to say it. I had to say it. Very cool. Mm. All the Germans are laughing at my funny German, okay? Because um, I have a very strange accent. They call it cute. Um, I'll take it. I'll take it, right? That's what I use to do that report. That and the Double Take app. All right? So oftentimes... I, I know I pulled out some of my little special stuff, but that is just what it is, special stuff. 90% of mobile journalism is just the phone. Just the phone and the knowledge of how to always be documenting with the right techniques, react to the right scenes, get the right clips, get the right, and know how to put it together. All right, it's the knowledge, it's the language. But if I know I'm going to a conference and I know I'm gonna be doing some box pops, that's all you need is a little kit here Something you can attach your, excuse me, you can attach your phone to. My hand is my phone here. It's a simulation. That's your phone. It clamps it. It's not a selfie stick. It's secure. Screws down, clocks it down. You can then attach it to a tripod. And then a good microphone that has a dead cat. Sorry if you're a cat lover, but that's what that's called. Blocks the wind noise. That's it. You can turn it around, do piece to cameras. You can do voiceovers with it. It's really versatile. A lot, of that, a lot of situations, that solves just about everything. Um, and then some of the specialty apps, you know, I work with a lot of broadcasters. They like to use Live View uh, to connect. And uh, again, if you go, just go to my blog or, you know, robmontgomery.com or the Smart Film School, you can get a list of these apps. I do keep it updated. Um, I do have one tip for tic TikTokers. Who's, how many TikTokers? couple. You want to be a TikToker? This is what it's going to take, I think. This is a pretty good tip here. Last I can do one. My trick also is to hold down the red button and let go when you want to stop filming. That is the best way to get it slick. Okay, let's go.
know my mom. That's why you shouldn't take advice about TikTok from middle-aged media consultants. <laughs> Look, it's a creative medium. I mean, I started down this road accidentally, got there um, completely um, by accident, and have never stopped learning and exploring this medium. Um, but I know in teaching it and working with newsrooms and you know editors in chief and you know broadcasters that want to have their journalists have those skills. I have to back them up and say, look, VJ, what I was doing at the volcano at the beginning, you're never going to get everyone in your newsroom at that level. And you don't want to give the person with those skills the press conference, the daily pressers. You've got to build that language throughout your organization and then make specialized teams that can do lives, that can, that can do the disaster stuff um, and be really intelligent about it. But you all have to be speaking the same language. You all have to know the ten types of video. You have to know the six-shot pattern. You have to know... Uh, how to set up your phones, and for that, you know, of course, I, I'm here to help. Uh, um, so I do training, and a lot of training I was doing was just really this kind of fundamental stuff. I know it sounds, maybe looks pretty sophisticated, but the stuff I'm showing you is pretty the ABCs um, of video storytelling. It's just using a mobile device, and that camera works differently. And if you've already know how to do video, it's learning how to do that camera better. These people make uh, four hours, each of them make four hours of television a year. They are at the top of their pyramid. They're in Singapore, the current affairs reporters. They have quarter million dollar budgets for their stories. They can hire crews around the world. They are at the top of their game. They wanted to know, they hired me to come in, spend a few days with them in the field and just monkeying around with stuff, trying different types of shots, seeing and talking about the stories that they're developing and seeing how this stuff might fit in. Everyone's mojo is a little bit different. So you gotta be willing to find your own mojo, maybe get up at six in the morning with me. Yes, I'm doing it again tomorrow. And uh, we'll have, well, you never know what'll happen. We'll never, what we'll find tomorrow morning. You don't need a lot of gear. If you want gear, you can get gear for less than a hundred bucks. You can get started pretty simple. The less stuff you take, the farther you can take it. I've been documenting over the last six years hut to hut mountain alpine hiking, okay? And that was the rig. There's my improvised little tripod to get a time lapse. If you're the BBC and you've got budget, this is how you're outfitting your reporters. Nice, but it's not always necessary, okay? Um, I'm also outfitting reporters with a lot of gear with the Middle East Broadcasting Networks. Like I said, last week I was in Washington. We spent four days. We had a different group each day. And they're also um, setting up their reporters and every reporter with this set of gear. And a lot, half of that table is stability, basically ways to lock down, you know, your phone to a tripod or a gimbal. Uh, and half of it are microphone and audio solutions because that is still the hardest thing to do and get right and takes the most um, practice and, and different situations require different setups. So we're giving it to them and we're saying, listen, don't try to use this for work right away. Use it for your TikToks. Use it for your family videos. Get, make it a habit. Try to make something short every day, 30 seconds. Try out and audition the peer and figure out which pieces are going to work for me. This approach is really working. Um, this approach is really working well. I know I'm going to skip this next Hello, bit is right here. Uh, I was going to talk, take you to a little small newsroom in Austria where they basically use mo they use three cases of Mojo. Um, they the, the small newsroom. They do lives. They do uh, s small news packages and they do short docs. So listen, if you I love mind mapping. Um, it, it really is a wonderful way to open up your mind um, and really figure out what, what you're looking at when you're looking at a typical news package. And like I say to the reporters I work with, you're responsible for all these elements of reporting, okay? And then how to put it together. I showed you how to put it together with the video editing app, but this is what you need to be doing when you're always be documented because those are the ingredients in really powerful and well done video stories. I don't have time to go here. I know if you want to also ask about vertical, um, here's a story shot once and output for two different um, user experiences, as you might say. This was done um, at the Very Large Telescope in um, 
the Atacama Desert, where my wife thought it was a good idea to spend six weeks um, uh, in a four-wheel drive and going around and making films. And we just walked into this place. Usually you have to make a, um, a reservation six months in advance. They only have one tour a month. Sometimes you get lucky. If you're ready when that happens and you happen to have a camera, what do you do? You can see what that looks like. You can see the vertical here. Um, and it's on YouTube. And then you can see the same shots cut for um, horizontal or television here. And it's just a fun example because we were in a tour group with 20 other people. There we are, the 20 other people. And we were the only two people who walked out with this story. Not because of the gear we had, but because of the techniques that we've developed. Look, um, this has been mainstream for a while, to use small cameras to tell big stories. That's Steven Soderbergh using an iPhone to film um, um, one of his recent films. He loves it because of that spontaneity. He doesn't have to get 12 people organized to turn on a big camera and say action. He can, he can improvise, he can be spontaneous with actors, um, and that changes you know, the style. So it's just a creative choice. There's no technical reason not to. So I was inspired by this, and I started to... Um, I was just making all these films, like I said, for my research so that I could teach journalists what works and what doesn't, right? And then oh, a few years ago, I realized, hey, there's this thing called Film Freeway. Why don't you submit some of your films, Rob? I said, okay. Smartphone to silver screen sounded good. So I did, and I started to win international film prizes. I got uh, Best Foreign Short Documentary in Hollywood for a film. <laughs> I love the Americans. Um, who will give you a best foreign film for a English-speaking Welsh woman <laughs> telling her story about how she's busking in the streets of Berlin. So sometimes you, you, know, you gotta be creative in how you enter contests because it can work out. Uh, or you get invited by the Nordic Press Association to do a mojo workshop uh, with some young people and they invite you to ice swimming. Well, yes, you have to say yes and you have to say yes, I'm going to film it. There I am in the middle, 92 seconds, the film, one. I have Maybe never we'll been we'll ice swimming it. before. We'll show it. And I would never have imagined that uh, I would do something like this, actually stepping into the, into the ice pool was a crazy experience where you sort of get this kind of oceanic feeling and sensation of, of being one with nature and also all the endorphins released. I actually thought I, I might faint or pass out. And then you watch all the Finnish people, you know, they just dive in, go for a swim, maybe every day, and then back into the sauna. It's inspiring. Then afterwards you can have a swim in the warmer pool and surrounded by all the fog and people swimming and watching the beautiful light of the sky in Helsinki, especially watching the sunrise. <laughs> Gives you a spark and uh, kind of uh, prepares you to go out and take over the world. So 92 seconds long, something like that. Um, Red carpet, roses, champagne, scary golden bird statue. It's fun to make movies. Um, especially when you didn't plan on it. That was just a result out of teaching uh, this topic. Um, and at the end of the week, I had this sequence of, of one of the students that we used to demonstrate with. And I said, look, I'm just going to push play and record here. I want you just to say, the f and speak ex extemporaneously, say the first thing that comes to your mind. Your mom said you, she would be proud of you for doing this. Start there. And I left the room. I said, knock on the door when you're done. And so that was what she recorded. That's a different type of interviewing. My pictures interviewed my subject. Epiphany. That was a really fun way to make a movie. There's nothing, nobody taught me that. It was just a complete inspiration from that moment. And so it's great that I won those prizes, but I could care less about journalism awards. I've got an, a, a boatload gathering dust somewhere. I don't care. What I want is my students to have those experiences. I want the people I train to have those experiences. 
So I made a few more entries, one bunch of more awards, just to prove the concept. And then I created the Mojo Awards with my nonprofit and some partners, um, including the School of Journalism at Ohio University, uh, School of New Journalism in, in France, um, American University in Cairo, Global Letters Network, um, and just said, I, we think this is a good idea. Let's make it. We have zero budget. But we got some cool sponsors because I run a 501c3 that I founded in 2004 called Visual Editors. This was all this accidental journey. Um, and then we got some cool judges. So some really top journalists, some top uh, professors to judge it. We've developed a 10-point criteria for entries. It's now in its fourth season, has just closed. I'd like to show you maybe one or two of those films before we take questions. That's in, I want you to know about this because I want to be able to show one of your films next year. I just showed this at Las Vegas at the BEA show. If you don't know what the BEA is, it's part of NAB. <clears throat> 100,000 people gathered in Las Vegas. <clears throat> and the BEA is the Broadcast Educators Association. And I showed these finalist films there, and I want to show them here every year. Um, the finalists, two from Germany. Welcome. Well done, Germany. Uh, one from Iraq, one from Finland, one from Morocco, and one from Australia. Or one from Scotland, done by an Australian. That's a great, that's a great one. Um, so we, there are three categories for the Mojo Awards. Um, mobile journalism story, you can say, okay, everything from social media to news packages, it doesn't matter the aspect ratio if it's square, horizontal, or widescreen. Um, up to three minutes. Um, if it's not in English, you've got to do it in English. Let's go to this one. Or you've got to give us subtitles. It's a good one. Show this. Is it rolling? Der kratzt ein bisschen F. If the F scratches, then it needs to be planed. Organ builder Hendrik Seebald grabs the pipe and carefully planes off some of the metal edge with some kind of an oversized pencil sharpener. The tone becomes minimally higher as a result. The organ builders don't have much time left. In just under a week, the organ is to be consecrated. And in the church of St. Konrad in Landshut, it doesn't look very festive yet. About one-fifth of the 3,150 pipes made of wood and metal still have to be installed and tuned. To design and build such an instrument in all its complexity is one thing. Specialized tuners like Bernd Reinhardt are responsible for the final timbre, the character of the organ and its effect in the church interior, with musicality and a lot of feeling. Unsere Arbeit ist das, was, was ein Dirigent macht, der mit dem Orchester arbeitet, im Vorfeld mit den Proben, wo es dann heißt, hier, da ein bisschen zurück und das muss kommen. Mit dem Unterschied, dass wir das ein einziges, wir haben nur einmal die Chance und dann ist das, das ist die Generalprobe für die nächsten 100 Jahre. Wir müssen das so einstellen, dass das eben immer funktioniert, auch bei unterschiedlich, äh, unterschiedlicher Literatur. I'm going to cut that one short, just because I want to let you know there's also a category for crisis reporting, which we, uh, we conferred with the judges last year when the Ukraine war started. Um, so last year we had entries, uh, we were able to have entries from the Ukraine war and, and uh, actually not even from Ukraine, but just from what the, that crisis, you know, uh, the global effect of it. Um, this one, I just want to show a little bit of this. This is a crisis of a different nature um, uh, in Morocco. By coincidence, this black traditional outfit seems to be the way to protest water scarcity. Here in Tigerman village, in the region of Tarudant, 600 kilometers from the capital, people are living without drinking water.
With the temperature at more than 35 degrees, you cannot find water. We are going to have a live screening event, so for the Mojo Awards, we'll be able to show all six finalists. Um, that'll be announced later. Best documentary. Um, this is, so what you saw was pretty kind of traditional, you know, video journalism, you know, crisis reporting, war reporting, news packages, social. But documentaries where you can spread your wings for between two and 12 minutes. Um, we've had winners. We've even had student winners. Um, three years ago, a student from Mexico City won um, Best Documentary. So it really is a level playing field. Uh, and here, of course, we want the ethics of photojournalism applied, um, but there is a lot more creative um, for how you uh, want to do your storytelling and a larger canvas. Um, so I just want to end with uh, Rob Layton's film. Rob's a journalism professor in Australia and went to the Isle of Skye. Right, and so this will be under 10 minutes, so there'll be time for questions. All right. All right, and we're rolling. There is an atmosphere about the place that draws you to it. And once it gets under your skin, it doesn't let go, you know? You, you speak to any of the locals and they believe in fairies. Well, I've, I have dived in the tropics. I prefer what I, I find in these waters. These creatures are, are just on our doorstep within easy reach of the shoreline in two or three foot of water. And, and for me, it's, it's just raising awareness to, to get protection. I've learnt to see so many of these creatures, and some of them are, are no bigger than the end of my fingertip. Um, and every single one of them is beautiful in its own right. Sea hares are a form of sea slug. They're really charismatic, very, very funny creatures. And um, despite being a slug, they've got eyes, so they can see you. Rightly so, we protect our whales and dolphins and sharks, but without these time through the water, you know, paddling and what have you, and there's, there's a multitude of, of creatures that are just living on the seabed in maybe one or two foot of water. The exhibition is definitely to try and raise awareness. Obviously, it's to showcase the, you know, the, the photography as part of it. At least we've, we, you know, you can only do what you can do, and we're doing it on a small scale. And, you know, if there were more projects like ours around the country, around the world, then it would all add up to helping to, to sort of, you know, raise awareness of what we are doing to the oceans. If you want to have a screening event with the Mobile Journalism Awards, let me know. I'm doing something next month uh, with the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. We'll, it'll be virtual, so it'll, it should be free. I'm not sure how they're going to ticket it. Um, but uh, that's the kind of stuff that's happening uh, by teaching journalists uh, how to tell big stories with small cameras. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, there's a microphone, and we'll have to use it because we are also being taped. Thank you. So there's questions back here. I don't know where the mic is. Maybe I have it. Um, so I'll come to you. How about that? Oh, it's coming. Right behind you. The gentleman in the glasses right behind you has a question. My name is Rob. I'm a journalism student. And my question is, um, 
what is your opinion on how to get the bet best feeling of how long a scene in a video should last? So you can take a picture and you can last it for like five or ten seconds, but then it will be kind of boring or kind of not boring. So how do you get the best um, the best timing to pu to put the scene and then go to the another scene? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and it's a lot to do with um, sometimes your house style. Like if you're doing a news package, you'll pretty much be, for like a broadcaster, you'll be told, we cut every three seconds in the USA. We're pretty fast paced. The UK is maybe cut every four, okay? You'll see that now when you watch some of the, the news reports on, on air. Those, those are kind of patterns or frequencies that you find. Now when you're in film, you hold as long as you need to. You might hold a moment longer because you're going through that emotional response. You know, you know you're working with music, you're working with maybe uh, people crying or something, and there's no reason to cut away. Uh, people have already committed to whatever length that viewing will be, so, that it, so it really depends on the user experience, like so much of what we do, right? What does your user expect? Are, are, you know, and that kind of would be the best answer for that, I suppose. Um, I find that the only way to really find it is um, to cut a lot of your own films. That's why I want you, if I'm teaching you, to cut your own stuff because it makes you shoot better and it tunes you, um, your storytelling better to, so you can better answer that question based on each, each, each story you're doing. Hi, so Hi. I would like to know what were the mistakes that you've made along the way? So in terms of the, the technical part, but also in terms of you know, the approach that you had with uh, guests or the people that you... Pick a story. Make. There's problems in every story. <laughs> this is why um, I don't show other people's work except award-winning work, because I know what worked and what didn't when I wanted to go film the giant condors at Pinnacles two weeks ago, okay? So there's a lot that doesn't work. What you have to be willing to do is experiment and find what works for you. Sometimes you're up against technical problems like the weather, okay? What's the name of this app again? Oh, this app is LumaFusion. So it's like a 30 or $40 one-time purchase, no subscription, and I really love it um, because it's, as you can see, I've got all of my examples here um, for multi-camera, for portraiture, for news packages, for breaking news. So when I'm teaching in my studio, this is what I'm doing. I, it's not a PowerPoint and a Zoom, okay? Um, when you're in, in, in sessions with me, I'm often going right into these edits and we'll talk about what worked, what were you trying to do, what did you learn? Um, because it's really informative when you try to say, um, uh, yeah, we filmed the Harry Potter train. We didn't know what that, how that was gonna end up, but we ended up getting that um, for five pounds. We, we didn't actually ride the Harry Potter train. We took the train before, and we took the train after. And in between, we figured out how to do a four-camera shoot, including my wife. My wife's the drone pilot, by the way. She's German. She's licensed. Um, if I were the drone pilot, we wouldn't have a drone. It would be in pieces. Um, so that's one thing I learned is I'm, not, I'm good at directing drone shots, but flying the drone, forget about it. I have one last question. So uh, we see and we saw also that TV is like the big thing still for the majority of people, at least in Portugal and in some countries in Europe. Yeah. So my question is, did you find some bias either from your peers, so from the TV broadcast, but also from the people that you are interviewing, like diminishing the work that you are doing with mobile journalism that is not TV, it's an almost TV, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's um, so obviously a lot of uh, television uh, groups and organizations are using mobile journalism. It's a layer in their reporting, um, and they will often go to it, um, especially when people are intimidated by the, the presence of a crew or a larger camera and all of the, the Hollywood stuff, you know, especially when they're, you know, vulnerable or, you know, they're shy. The, the camera, the mobile camera is friendly and familiar. So in, again, it's a superpower. It's not that you always use it. It's like, how do you know when to balance which, which technique you're going to use? This comes through experience and making it part of your routine, training your journalists, getting everyone speaking the same language, yeah. And then don't shoot vertical because you can't put that stuff on air. But you can always cut vertical from properly shot horizontal video. And what I'm at, 30 seconds or am I done? 
I'm done. Okay. Hotel, Ristorante del Sole, I'll be there. You can meet my crazy wife. Cheers. Uh, for who wants to attend to the other event here, need to do the line again.